Hello and welcome to the Functional Health Podcast with Ben Atkinson. I'm delighted to be joined by functional sports dietitian Rick Miller, where we dive into the topic of men's health for physical performance and longevity. We discuss how to navigate the world of training for men, Rick's take on the optimal diet, which is very different from last time he was on the show, and also we discuss common pitfalls and how best to avoid them. I hope you get something positive out of this discussion because I certainly did. Let's get into it. Rick, great to see you again. Great to have you on the show. It's great to be here, Ben. Absolute pleasure. And I love the new facility. How long have you been here? Where are we? <laughs> <laughs> well, we're at King Edward VII's Hospital in Marylebone, Ben. Uh, I've, I've been at King Edward's uh, since 2018, so pre-pandemic. Mm-hmm. And uh, we've been in this new facility, the Cantor Medical Center, since early of this year so i think it was around march we moved into this building so yeah yeah beautiful building and you were telling me before about your new partnership with jack everton can you yeah what's that about yeah so basically um as a natural extension of uh my dietetic practice you know exercise is a hugely important component but i'm not a qualified personal trainer so i tend to outreach those sorts of services and uh jack is a a very uh uh, exceptional personal trainer um, who specializes in physique and uh, body transformation, um, particularly with men, who um, I hope we're going to talk about uh, in this podcast today. <laughs> um, and effectively, we, 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 we just joined forces. You know, we, uh, we formed a partnership, uh, Miller and Everton, and we now focus um, pretty much solely on uh, getting men into optimal condition and helping them on the path to true health. I love that. Why did you pivot to start focusing on men's health specifically? It's actually a, a nice story. Um, so you'll know this, I'm sure, that um, that nutrition in general in the UK, and I'm pretty sure it's the same across the world, is pretty female-dominated. So I think at last check, it was something like 85% of of dietitians in the UK are female. Um, and I'm counted amongst about 100 and I think 150 Dieti- male dietitians and there are something like 8,000 uh, female dietitians so it's pretty you know you're you're pretty much an endangered species <laughs> if you're a, if you're a male dietitian I would say it's the same for nutritionists and nutritional therapists yes as, as, as far as I understand and basically when I first qualified as a dietitian and I went into my NHS practice as most dietitians do um I was really astounded at the reaction of my male patients And what I realized was that when I was carrying over or taking caseloads from other dietitians who were female, and, you know, this I'm sure is not every dietitian, it's just my experience, um, the look of relief on some of these men's faces to be talking to another man about their health, I think was quite, was quite overwhelming for me, because sometimes these these men would just look at you and, and it would all come out. All these things that weren't in their medical notes, mm-hmm. you know, about erectile dysfunction or depression or things that are going on at home, or all these other health issues that they've got or their drinking issues or feeling inadequate and all these things that, you know, you'd look out at them at the waiting area. You'd never have thought for a second, you know, full of full of male bravado. <laughs> and that's when it first kind of dawned on me that I thought just being a man and talking to another man in nutrition, I think is such an important thing. And um, the the truth is, is that the more I started to explore this area, and luckily I was working in Doncaster at the time and living in Leeds. And in Leeds, there is um, an amazing uh, men's health um, facility, actually. Um, there's a huge research facility at Leeds Beckett. And it's all run by Professor Alan White, who's a professor of men's health. And um, I was shocked at the statistics. Um, Basically, um, as it stands in the UK, um, men will die of every major condition younger than women. And that is all the way up until retirement. And suddenly then it changes a little bit and it starts to flatten out. We can talk about that a little bit later. Um, They're more likely to die from any form of cancer than women. They're far less likely to go to the doctor. And overall, throughout their entire life, they'll have far fewer contacts with a healthcare professional until retirement, as I mentioned. And disproportionately and you and i i'm sure will this is no you're not a stranger to this they just don't access mental health services mm-hmm. um compared to compared to to women 
And uh, some of the reasons were exposed in a recent report called the Harry's Report on masculinity that was run by uh, Professor John Barry um, at UCL. Some fascinating information that maybe we can get into. Um, Absolutely. And um, that's part of the reason why Jack and I decided we've got to focus on guys because it's not just about getting six packs and, you know, getting big biceps. It's about this path to true health, which I think if we don't help more men, they may never reach it. And that's exactly why we're so passionate about this area. And I mean, one thing I think is very admirable, ad- admirable. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> but I also think it's um, some people might be sat at home and thinking, well, they might see men in their practice. Um, it's no, not a reflection on, you know, women's ability or female uh, practitioners ability to to engage with men and in fact there might be some men who prefer to see a a female uh, dietitian nutritionist nutrition practitioner and it's it's simply it's simply that um in our experience and just looking through the data um especially from the men's health forum um that men do tend to engage better with other men on the whole and it's it's not a it's not a sexual dimorphism it's simply that um I think I think many would attest, you know, from maybe the other side of the of the sexual barrier that, you know, talking about maybe gynecological issues, you know, for for a woman with uh, a male gynecologist might be very difficult, you know, mm-hmm. or similarly to talk about other, you know, traditionally female related concerns with a, another woman is much easier. Yeah. And I think it's okay to 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 give men the choice, just like it's absolutely, absolutely okay for give women the choice and uh, that's why we've done this you know to give men that choice they want to talk to another man and to work with men we're here for them i love that with, with you, your combination in terms of your partnership with jack what does jack bring to the table from a physical performance and training point of view so um what jack brings to the partnership really is that um obviously like I said before, there's only so much that I can do in terms of, of nutrition and, and nutrition and, and exercise go hand in hand in terms of health, you know, without one, the other is compromised in some way, you know, you overemphasize one, then, you know, you don't get the benefits of the other necessarily. So having him here to, uh, to support, you know, a very vital component of, of the practice is, is the first reason. The second one though, is that, um, I think it's, it's starting to die away a little bit. Um, I think with the more kind of modern masculinity, uh, culture. Um, so it's becoming, uh, I think less of a, a concern, I think with the, the kind of the modern kind of a, a take on, I think on, on kind of masculinity and what it means to be a man, you know, I think, uh, you know, in, uh, traditionally, I think, you know, to have said that, you know, you, you wanted to improve your physique or wanted to build muscle and things like this was probably deemed to be un, unmasculine. It was like, oh, why do you want to worry about that? You know, what's <laughs> that, what, why, why bother about those sorts of things? But I think now, I think, um, I think what we're starting to see is that, um, is that many men are, are concerned about their, their physical appearance. They are worried about, um, you know, the, uh, their aesthetic. Um, and so, we wanted to make sure that that is a way that potentially they might engage, you know? Mm. So, so for instance, we have quite a lot of men who initially come just for that. So they come in the door saying, yep, I want to, you know, I want to shed these pounds. I don't, I don't feel confident anymore. I'm, I'm, I'm not happy with the way I look. And that's the first step, you know, they've come in to do that. And that probably was quite a big step for them to admit that. Um, <laughs> for some men, it really, I think it really is um, to admit that, you know, they need to get some help. But then the rest of it comes out, just like I mentioned. Yes. You know, then it's the maybe the mental health. Maybe let's have a look at your bloods, you know, and see what's going on there. And then we see that maybe those lipids are not in, in good shape necessarily. Mm-hmm. And maybe they've not had, you know, they've had maybe chronic. Just recently I had a gentleman come in had 10 years of chronic gastric problems, never been to a doctor and had wow. ins- and had insurance of all things, had the medical insurance, had not been um because he didn't feel like it was a big problem um and you know he didn't want uh, he didn't want somebody poking around in there you know and obviously that was that was understandable um but all these things i think started to come out i think as part of the service and this is when we knew that we were starting to do the right thing because we're starting to actually really help people um and we're helping our male um male patients 
That makes perfect sense to me. And it's interesting because like lowering your body fat percentage and increasing your muscle mass mm. has huge benefits, not just okay. on the way that you look, right? Of course it does. Of course it does. We know that um, part of the reason that, pe uh, that people develop insulin resistance is because of this um, intramuscular triglyceride. And just by starting, you know, resistance training, you know, reducing that body fat level, we're starting to change the dynamic in terms of the fuels that we're using. So using more of the of the free fatty acids, the body fat um, and the fats that we're eating through our diet and less dependency on glucose. So we're sparing our poor pancreases and then hopefully we're staving off diabetes, which is, the you know, the next big pandemic well it is the, the the bigger pandemic if you think about it in many ways you know the billions of people around the world who've got type 2 diabetes and mm -hmm. what's the reason mismanaged as well mismanaged. which is the biggest problem with people getting limbs chopped off and uh, exactly it's heartbreaking really and if we think about you know again go back to those male statistics men are more likely to have diabetes than than their female counterparts according to the statistics but they're less likely also to go and present to their doctors so how many men mm. how accurate are these statistics how many men are sitting there at home with chronically elevated glucose levels or at least just insulin resistant and they don't even know and this is what we're seeing you know young men coming into clinic with with insulin resistance all the signs of that we're picking it up and we're saying look you know you can do something about it and i think that's quite empowering for a lot, especially a lot of our kind of, um, I want to get on and do something, men, you know. Yeah, I mean, it's very interesting talking about the common issues that men experience. How how often do you find that a man has insulin resistance? I would say at least 60 to 70% of the men that come through our, our doors, which is quite frightening. Yeah, and, that is frightening. It's frightening. And it's not even... It's not even through the conventional panels that mm. we're seeing. So again, if they presented to their, their GP and they checked their fasting glucose and their HbA1c, um, their glycosylated hemoglobin, they wouldn't be in the pre-diabetic range. But we're, when we check their fasting insulin, it's already, in, it's already starting to elevate. Um, and it blows some, my mind how GPs can't test that. Well, yeah, uh, um, there, are some, there are some practical reasons, um, but really those, those are usually they can be sorted out to be honest you know because obviously insulin is being such a delicate you know peptide you know you've got to get it to the lab really fast and that's sometimes used as a reason um we've never found it to be a problem um but we also use indirect calorimetry um in our clinic and that mm -hmm. um really helps to pick up on that kind of early stages of you know fuel mismanagement for want of a better word if somebody's fasted um, you know, for 12 hours plus, and then they're coming in and they're burning lots of, of glucose effectively. They're, they're, they're kind of their respiratory exchange ratio, which is a, a, an indication of the types of fuels they're using at a cellular level is above one when they're fasted. Now that's a concern. Mm -hmm. That's a real concern. And, uh, we were just chatting before the podcast about, um, one trap who's a, a bodybuilder who we're working with at the moment. And, you know, you wouldn't think for a second that he's insulin resistant but he is he's frankly in, he's insulin resistant and you know having changed his diet he's thriving we've got those numbers changed and you know he's feeling better for it and gaining strength this is the craziest thing so you know this is this is the thing where um i think we're in a, a different type of pandemic you know that we're which is missing because we're not asking the right questions and doing the right tests with these men yeah, absolutely. Uh, fascinating that he's increasing muscle mass and strength as well yeah. as a bodybuilder. Yeah, yeah. That, that whole, um, I guess it was bro science at the time where you had to eat a certain amount of carbohydrates, but there are still sports performance benefits, I guess, with like glycolytic exercise, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. Where you are of course, yeah, a lot yeah. of power. It'd be interesting that he's, uh, yes. that he's improving. Yeah, exactly. And I think, I think again, it's just, um, I think it's about pushing against the the conventional paradigm and just mm. you know realizing that you know even if you look at those classic um kind of um sports science studies where we where we first saw the crossover concept you know where you know as you start to do a, a higher proportion of vo2 max you get this beautiful curve you know where people switch over to using carbs for fuel and they stop using fats but you'll even notice on those curves there's always an outlier there's somebody up there still burning fat mm -hmm. at like you know 70%, 80% of VO2 max. So, you know, clearly there are, there are personal differences between individuals and what they can tolerate and, and what fuels they should be using. And sticking people in boxes just, it isn't helpful. It isn't helpful whether you're a man or a woman. I completely agree. 
What other issues do you see in your clinic that affect men primarily? So um, a lot of the mental health issues, I would say, um, is, is a big one. Uh, so again, a lot of kind of unmanaged um, depression uh, or anxiety, you know, mm-hmm. comes through. Um, very poor self-esteem sometimes, you know, and that, and it wouldn't be apparent when you meet people, obviously. It takes a little bit of time often for these things to come out, trust to be built. Mm-hmm. Um, but again, not access talking therapies. Um, and that, again, is very uh, common, as I mentioned before, from the Harry report. So the Harry Masculinity Report um, demonstrated um, that men are very, very unlikely to reveal um, mental health concerns to a therapist. And quite often they, uh, I guess, hack the uh, the consultation a little <laughs> bit. They, they kind of say all the right things and get out there as fast as they can. But here's the crazy thing. They were more likely to reveal exactly how they were feeling to a chatbot. No way. Absolutely way. That's the craziest thing. So that just shows that there isn't a one-size-fits-all model. And yes, there are differences between sexes in terms of potentially how they might like to convey their mental health or mm-hmm. the need their needs. And it starts off with a conversation. Now, the amazing thing about the Harry's report is that um, it, it demonstrated that that can start the conversation. Obviously, it can't finish it. Yes. A chatbot is an artificial intelligence machine. It's not a therapist. Um, so, it, you know, it's not a solution. But it can it can provide that gateway to getting support and um, we also feel that in some ways we're, we're doing that as well by building up that trust. And as you say, it might be that they've come in with one thing and then they start to talk about another because they've built up that sufficient trust with us. So that's a huge thing for us. Um, the other one I would say is, again, as I mentioned, is um, chronic gastric concerns yes. that are just totally unmanaged. Do you feel that people aren't going to their GP about this because they're embarrassed in some way? or It's a mixture. It's yeah. a real mixture. Um, so... Again, the the data on this is quite poor. Um, again, from a kind of epidemiological perspective, um, when we look at you know observational uh, studies in the UK, around anywhere between ten and twenty five percent are supposedly have irritable bowel syndrome. Mm-hmm. But again, these are all self reports, um, and again, the they're often quite a disproportionate in terms of the male and female respondents in those surveys. And again, I question, you know, how many of those respondents. Were, were willing to do the actual reporting and mm-hmm. they weren't you know weren't brought forward and then they said yes i would like to take take part so i question that data i think it's i think it's the um the one that you said before which is that um, i think many are embarrassed um about you know there's a lot of taboos around toilets and poo and all these sorts of things and we often we don't want to reveal those things you know to to a stranger i'm always reassuring my patients you know i've heard it all and i've seen it all and even then they don't want to talk about it so i think there's that and there's also the the concern about what it might mean as well it's the realization that you know if i'm bleeding from the back passage or i've had a massive change in bowel habit yeah what might that mean you know for my health and i think you know there is a bit of a kind of maybe sweeping under the carpet and hoping for a, um hoping it will go away and we and gently we we kind of um we unpick those things you know between us jack and i and uh, we try to get those things out and ha- help hopefully our, our men feel safe and they can they can talk about these things um the other one is sometimes is, um, again, is a worry about um, sexually transmitted diseases as well. Even, you know, again, um, not going to genital urinary, urinary medicine clinics, you know, not getting regular checkups if they're, if they're sexually active or engaging in unprotected sex, you know. And, and, and these things, I think, need to be talked about, you know, in, a, in a frank manner because they can destroy lives, you know, if they're not managed. And there are so many great treatments now. Uh, for these sorts of conditions and you know uh, so th- this is the sort of things that we see a lot quick pause we're thrilled to say that our sponsor for this podcast today is human people human people is a personalized health platform set up by functionally trained doctors and nutritionists right here in the uk and they're on a mission to give you a healthier longer and more productive life When we start to feel a bit tired, get aches, pains, or brain fog, it can be a challenge to work out the root cause of that problem and how we can solve it. 
Well, human people are offering a solution. They empower you to better understand your health issues and use AI technology to provide clear, actionable steps to help you meet your goals. Choose between blood, DNA, and gut tests to look for common nutritional deficiencies and important gene SNPs and get your personalized recommendations reviewed by a doctor and all for less than a price of your daily coffee. The quality of their supplements is excellent and their recyclable packs means no more plastic bottles filling up your cupboard. Better for you, better for the planet. Head over to humanpeople.co slash functional health and use code functional health or one word at checkout to get 10% off any of their tests. And if you purchase any of their bundles, you'll get six months of a high quality omega-3 supplement absolutely free. Feel better, live healthier, and start your journey today at humanpeople.co slash functional health. Back to the show. I mean, talking about performance and longevity, the, if these conditions aren't treated, they have a massive hindrance on how long you live, but yeah. not only your health, your lifespan, but your health span. I love that phrase. You know, you've taken the words out of my mouth. I, I literally use the same word with a patient this afternoon is that, yeah, it's how many quality years absolutely got, you know as opposed to just how many years you're living you know propped up by medication or whatever it is <laughs> yeah so. that's true that's true as well um i always joke my great uncle was on something like 23 different medications but he lived until he was 87 and i don't know what concoction he was on <laughs> but he was he was very happy he's still functioning <laughs> but um <laughs> that's rare yes right that someone's happy with all those meds yes um when we talk about men's health, and this is quite a broad question, what are the biggest levers you think we can pull with regards to improving their performance and longevity? Um, so firstly, I think um, the first thing is to think about motivators, first of all. Um, and I think, again, this is something that needs to be challenged. Again, I think in a, uh, a difficult culture we have at the moment where we're, we're where masculinity is often is often you know pointed at as being a problem, mm -hmm. um, and and for many reasons it is you know there toxic are, masculinity. Yeah, yeah, for it's, sure. It's a, fra it's a phrase that's that's thrown around a lot. Um, one thing again that the the Harry report again revealed is the uh, the thoughts pro thought processes from men around what they feel being masculine really means. Um, and I think what's really interesting is that the Harry report didn't really get a lot of airtime in the media at all um and it actually revealed some quite amazing things is that the majority of the men in the survey um actually felt that masculinity meant about meant things like moral values like honesty reliability more than physical values such as fitness and being athletic right now that really was quite interesting because you know, it challenges this paradigm that, 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 that the kind of thing that's driving men is just power and, you know, you know, beating off everybody else, you know, and being the biggest and the best. Sure. I mean, I mean, testosterone does encourage men to, 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 to act sometimes in that way. But it shows that I think underneath all that, that the, the kind of the, the core values that for many men, it's like, you know, they, they want to be just honest and reliable guys, you know, and to provide for their loved ones in some ways. And, um, one of the, weirdly enough, one of the strongest predictors of um, of kind of, I guess, satisfaction and um, and 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 mental positivity was um, how reliable they were in their work. Mm -hmm. So when we're asking men around, you know, what's going to motivate you to change or to improve your health, a lot of the things that come through are around being a good provider, helping their family, being more available for people doing more stuff not being at the desk all day long and that's really interesting for me as well so i think in terms of leveraging men in terms of making changes for longevity it's thinking about these things and asking these questions i think of patients you know like how would it how would it affect your ability to help your loved ones and things like this this is really important um the other one as well is thinking about um you know the way that they're training at the moment and the way and the way that they're approaching their training their nutrition um one thing that drives me nuts, um, and I think this, this, this definitely drives Jack nuts as well, is when we see these kind of articles in, you know, popular magazines or popular blogs where it says, like, how to train in your 30s, how to train in your 40s, how to train in your 50s. And it's like, well, you know, what if I'm 49, you know, and I don't feel like I'm 49, you know, it's, it, it's just it's just crazy. And yes, there is a um, 
there, we can't deny it that obviously you know there is a kind of a uh, a genetic load that's placed on us um, that maybe limits our ability to recover. But I certainly don't believe that, um, that you know, there's a certain way that 30 year olds must train and 40 year olds must train. I think there's certain pillars that we need to knock off when it comes to longevity and physical performance. Um, and I, well, certainly we, Jack and I, um, we draw back on the work of Peter Atia. Yes. Uh, Dr. Peter Atia. Wonderful th- practitioner, amazing and researcher. Yeah, yeah, and I think he's he's really got it spot on with with his approach to kind of training for longevity. You know, focusing on kind of four pillars: um, stability, strength, aerobic efficiency, and anaerobic performance. And within that, you can obviously get a, an amazing aesthetic change as well in people as well. So it's not like you know you have to do all these at the expense of you know obtaining your six pack or your you know your V V taper or whatever it is you're trying to achieve um this can all be done at the same time so i think ensuring that the training programs for men are balanced across these areas i think Mm. is crucial if we're thinking about training for the long run you know and being functionally you know um you know able you know in our later years um and then i think really it's you know it's, it's thinking about the context you know and asking asking guys these questions you know what what is what is their goal you know is it to be more flexible is it are they trying to move more fluidly is it to play more with the kids is it to be confident running Mm. on the beach without their top on you know is it (laughs) you know uh, you know it's 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 you know we're we're joking but you know for for some men that is like you know just not feeling embarrassed you know when i go to the park and it's really hot and playing with my kids you know that's a a big driver for them you know to to change you know to be a again a role model you know, for my, for the loved ones, you know, just really interesting. Well, something that you said to said, which uh, really resonated with me, the fact that you could have, or that you need a different training program for different age groups. This drives me nuts too. Yeah. So, so I, I hear a lot like, oh, I'm too old. I couldn't do what you do. I was like, maybe not to the same intensity straight off the bat, right? Cause you yeah. might get injured, yeah. but you could definitely work up to it. You know what I mean? Yeah. That's my, well, that's my opinion. I would love to know yours. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, I, I kind of lean on on, on Jack, who, who, who very kindly gave me, you know, his opinion on it, his very <laughs> strongly worded opinion. I wish it came from him because he just really says things in, you know, such an amazing way. Um, but, you know, he feels exactly the same way. You know, what, whatever, whatever you want to achieve, you know, is possible within the physical means that you're presenting with. Mm-hmm. And if you don't have those things off the bat, as you say, you can work up to them. Yeah. And then it's just, you know, it's purely your ability to put in the work, you know, your ability to recover, you know, the genetics you've been blessed with. That's the only thing that those three things are the things that are going to hold you back in the end. Um, You know, time, program, nutrition, and then genetics, you know, after that. I mean, there are studies showing that strength training programs can benefit people even in their 90s. So never mind if you're 50 thinking like, oh, I couldn't go to the gym anymore because yeah. I don't know, everything's a little bit creaky or sore. You can work through it. You can work within your, your remit and yeah. what you have right now. And again, I think it, like nowadays, like the, the paradigm is changing. There's just so much choice when it comes to training uh, that, you know, challenging the limiting beliefs of particularly, I think, you know, um, our, our male uh, patients, I think is, is really important. You know, so again, let's go back to the practicalities of of that. We're trying to get somebody active. We want them to build a bit more muscle mass, you know, for, you know, stopping insulin resistance, you know, building up some muscle tissue, maybe for aesthetic reasons. Yeah. And the gym is a great place to start with that. Maybe they're a bit bit embarrassed to go there at the moment. You know, what else can we do? We've got to think outside the box. Is there ways that we can do it with home training? Can we do calisthenics? Can we do, you know pilates can we do something else can we do martial arts you know anything that's that's moving that needle towards more resistance building the strength in the tissue and then getting that ad- adaptation that's that's the key thing here as opposed to you know sadly um what what i often experienced in my in my first kind of years as a dietitian which was just no advice being given to to, to any patients let alone mm. male patients and again you know, there's people now probably screaming at the podcast saying, I give, I give advice out. And to those people, I say, hurrah, you know, thank, thank God. Um, but it certainly wasn't my experience when I first started. It, exercise advice was, was, was quite um, prescriptive and it was mostly based around the, um, uh, you know, the, uh, the public health guidance. And I think that just simply 
doesn't work. I think, you know, when, when um, exercise is prescriptive, it's different. Mm-hmm. When it's just given as blanket advice for everybody, I think the engagement is often quite poor. We know this with nutrition. So when it becomes prescriptive, it's like, okay, this is your personal prescription or your supplementation protocol for exercise. I think there's some power in that. Absolutely. I completely agree with you. And these blanket recommendations do not suit anyone by any means. Um, You mentioned martial arts. I know you used to take part in martial arts yourself. Is that something that you do? Still do. (laughs) Still do. Yeah. Yeah. I love, um, yeah, I love my karate. I've been doing it a very long time. Um, I work uh, closely with uh, England karate and I'm very proud to say that my original sensei all those years ago when I was a, um, a very unathletic teenager and stepping, (laughs) stepping into a dojo for the first time. Um, he is now the, uh, the England, uh, squad kata. So the, the kind of the forms um, part of the um, of the training um, leader. So he's amazing. the head coach. So um, yeah, um, it's it's amazing to have kind of completed the cycle in that way. Yeah, but I I love martial arts. Um, it's a uh, you know it's a huge passion of mine. And how what kind of benefits have you got from that yourself? Wow, uh, goodness, where to even begin? <laughs> uh, aside from the obvious physical benefits, because of the. Um, the style of karate that I've done, which is Shotokan for, for many years, it's, you know, often cited as the most popular style of, of karate, you know, around the world. And it's probably the one that most people have tried and that, or that they've seen. Um, it's a very physically demanding style. So it's kind of, it's emphasized by low stances, a lot of emphasis put on holding stances for a long time, strong movements, a lot of conditioning work, you know, if you go to the right dojo. Um, similar to Koyoka Shinkai, which is a full, full contact style of karate. Um, so aside from the physical benefits that I got, um, I would say um, there were a lot of um, benefits that were more nuanced that came from martial arts. Weirdly enough, I mean, whilst there are obviously cases where, and I, and I read it even in my local paper, that, you know, sadly a mixed martial artist got into a fight with somebody and it was, you know, it ended in this poor person, you know, not making it in a hospital. On the whole, when I have met other karate practitioners they have said that doing martial arts has actually made them a even less desire to get into a fight if they can absolutely avoid it so it's it's almost like the root of passive pacifism <laughs> by doing martial arts which seems really odd but you realize i think how much power we have inside of us when mm-hmm. applied in the right way um, and how much damage we can do to another human being um and so i think that you know, I think that humbles you in some ways. And that's all something I've always walked with thinking, you know, this is, you know, to, 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 to quote a comic book with great power comes with great responsibility. You know, I'll let you guess which one that is. <laughs> um, so I think that, um, that, that, that's something that was, was really quite telling for me with martial arts. The other thing obviously is the major confidence benefits it gave to me as well as a young man, you know, um, you know, you're, you with, if you're going to be, uh, facing an opponent <laughs> and they're going to be throwing kicks and punches in your way. You've got to be, you know, you've got to be willing to stand there and, you know, and to be confident and, and know that you're either going to, your body's going to react in the right, right way, or you're going to get out the way, you mm-hmm. know, one of the two. Um, and there's, there's a kind of a, a confidence threshold that you have to get over to do that. Um, and the last thing I think really is, is discipline. Um, the, the going back when you don't get it right, you know, when you got your bottom handed to you, you know, um, in, over in time and time again. And this is not something that is unique to martial arts. This is in all sports and all sporting pursuits, you know, the, the, the dedication to, to, to the craft, I think. But there's something quite special around martial arts in this because it, it's built into the especially traditional martial arts is built into the kind of the fundamentals of the system um you know this kind of endless pursuit of perfection to to be the best that you can be and um that's why i think martial arts are really powerful for children particularly in my uh, my two well, my my boy does uh, karate and uh, my little girl, I hope, will take up um, some some sort of martial arts. She's a bit young at the moment. She's not even two. But, you know, I'm still getting her to do spins. And, you know, we're practicing whatever we can, you know, to get her to get used to falling carefully. And, you know, I, I think there's, a, there's major benefits, I think, especially in this day and age where, um, you know, young people are kind of increasingly in a virtual world. And 
you know, to do something visceral and real, like, you know, engaging in martial practice, I think mm. is something that, that, you know, they're dying for. Gen Z is dying for, you know, our young people. And I think they can really give something quite powerful. That's not instant gratification. Yes, which all of us have yeah. on our phones all the time. Bingo. Um, I completely agree with you when you were talking about how these kind of sports and martial arts can benefit anyone and, mm. and how other sports can benefit in the similar ways. However, I think there's something about contact sports where it builds resilience yes. unlike anything else. Yes. You know, I used to have been a couple of times in a ring amateur boxing, mm. right? And I know getting hit in the face a few times. <laughs> yes, I right? know. <laughs> I know that feeling. After that's happened and you really got, got your bottom hands into you, like you put it before, yeah. um, your whole day is less stressful, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because no, nothing really matches that afterwards. No, no, I agree. There is a, there is a, a major humbling that, that you get um, when, it, yeah, when you, you're in combat sports. Yeah, there is something. And it's something that you can't really um, explain very well. Hence, we're not doing a great, probably a great description on the podcast at the moment for listeners. Um, you really have to just try it. And um, I think usually... Um, people are surprised at how much they often enjoy it and usually not for the reasons that they think, which is like, you know, I'm going to get to learn how to do some crazy, you know, Kung Fu move or whatever it is. It's actually, as you say, it's that realizing that I'm, I can be more resilient than I thought I could be. Yeah, absolutely. But it's the same when you lose a particular sport mm -hmm. as well. If you're rowing and you lose against another yeah. team, you know, it is humbling. It yeah. doesn't matter how hard you've worked you've still lost mm, quite and that is still as much of a learning as it is to to win in my yes. opinion absolutely maybe even more so how important is physical activity in different stages of life i think it's it's crucial at every stage of life um i mean gosh we don't i mean we've we are definitely on your podcast we've we've talked about uh, sedentary behavior before and the uh, the impact it has i mean but if we think about it from a you know just from an ancestral point of view you know um our, and just look at the human body we're designed to move we're not designed really to sit for prolonged periods as we're doing now as we're sitting <laughs> in this podcast you know we're both moving around itching to get out of the seat but, um we're not slouching uh <laughs> And it's, it's, it's that proprioceptive feedback um, on the human body, being in touch with the ground, learning to move, um, much like the, um, uh, the kind of the teachings of Ido Portal, you know, who you'll know, yeah. yeah, is, I think is, is, it's, it's, I mean, he, he, his kind of, um, his kind of musings are bordering on almost on like, almost like a spiritual experience, which mm. is quite, you know, something that I, I can't quite, can't get my head around, but definitely from a kind of a, just a pure proprioceptive activity physical activity and movement is is vital to our existence and again when we when we bring up young people and children specifically in a in a highly sedentary environment which is very difficult i i totally i totally hear any parents out there you know who are, again who are shouting at the uh at the uh the podcast now um i do understand you know how difficult it is to to raise small children and also to look after lots of kids because i used to run a weight management camp before i became a dietitian and um the uh but the, the movement for all stages of life is just crucial to our development we, we have to do it we cannot sit and sit and sit you know and and it's transformative mm -hmm. when you see people start to move again yeah after a period of sedentary behavior it's like they open up like a sort of like a, a, a flower coming into blossom you know to use a metaphor it comes back to the old saying that if you don't use it you'll lose it Quite. right and that always happens absolutely sarcopenia and muscle wastage etc but with children as well it does so much more in my opinion because even just from a detox point of view you're moving lymphatics around at any age um, and bdnf is something mm. which i don't think is spoken about enough and i'm not sure of any clinical data that i've seen on children mm. and exercise and how that relates to learning mm. however i imagine the effect is profound Absolutely. because you have people now or children now and teenagers and even adults um in the 30s 40s 50s 60s which are very sedentary whether they're watching tv or playing video games and they're not moving outside mm. or doing anything yeah, yeah. and i feel this is just i mean we talk about a tsunami of alzheimer's on the horizon and i feel like this has to be 
be part of it. I mean, that is that is my opinion based on some of the data I've seen. I'd love to know your thoughts. Well, I mean, if you look at, again, I, I look to um, modern hunter-gatherers as my kind of reference point. And, you know, when I say modern day hunter gatherers, I'm thinking of kind of um, tribes such as the Hadza tribe in, yes. in Tanzania. Um, There's the Kun the, as well. Yeah. Kun, you know, as well, which um, I can't do the uh, <coughs> the clicking noise um, uh, you're supposed to do. And the uh, I guess the Maasai to, a, to, a, to a, a, a sort of lesser extent, because many of these tribes are becoming more Western, you know, as their lands are getting taken for agricultural or reasons or they're getting moved out for political reasons. They're losing some of their, their kind of traditional roots. But then you look at the incidence of chronic disease amongst these uh, these individuals. You look at, again, the, uh, the, the behavior of the children. There mm -hmm. have actually been a number of pediatric orientated observational studies looking in the Hadza tribes, and they've noted um, the general behavior of the children. Um, again, the the tendency, for, weirdly enough, for like tantrums, uh, for outbursts, um, for general um, attention deficit behavior, almost non-existent, to be honest. And, you know, you might, you know, again, you might decry and say, well, of course, because they're living in the uh, the wilderness and it's a paradise. And it's like, well, it's not really. It's actually quite a harsh environment to live in. And again, if you're a hunter-gatherer, you know, there are other extremes to deal with, you know, like, you know, food not being there. There's wild animals around, you know, if you break your legs and there's no modern medicine, mm. you know, so it's a pretty harsh environment. And the children are, you know, uh, some might say to an extent, feral in that they're left to their own devices to play to explore to to learn and you know within reason i try to do similar things with with my kids to allow them to to not be sterilized you know to um, we do, we just don't have any screens really around you know when they're when they're when they're playing and we just let them try to just make their own fun and imagination and i think that is what you're getting at really with the propensity of dementia that that is going to continue to to build if we um if we basically if we truncate children's ability to use their brains and to and to imagine and to and to fall and to do all the physical things that they should be doing and building up that muscle tissue as you say that you know their ability to balance and to do all these things you know if they're sat on the ground you know playing Fortnite, then everything is in a virtual world yeah. Um, and I mean, you know, and again, I don't again, I don't intend to, you know, offend anybody who's a, you know, who's an avid esports player. You know, that in itself is an athletic endeavor. And I and I and I totally get that. Um, but the I think for the majority of time, if we think about human optimization, um, um, you know, we, like I said, we are built to move, you know. Absolutely. And I completely agree with you about the esports. Yeah. But in terms of longevity. I can't imagine sitting for six hours at a time <laughs> like we actually do. Office workers do that. I do that on occasion. Yeah. I try not to I try and have frequent breaks, but it is something that most people are yes. prone to nowadays. Yeah. And and again, if you look at how strangely enough for the very little data we've got on professional esports players, they retire incredibly early. There's some they, they, they retire younger than most uh, professional gymnasts. So, you know, most of them, the average, you know, uh, career is spanning from, you know, 16 up until about 25 and then they're done. They're burnt out. They're finished. You know, I think um, one very famous, um, if I believe, um, I think North Asian player for a very famous um, esports team who I can't remember the name of, he um, had to bow up because he had um, diabetes. You know, he developed insulin resistance and then diabetes during his course of play now again That's incredibly sad you know it, it is really really sad because um we don't understand the ramifications of of this game of this, this extended game playing and um you know how to how to manage these players making a note to myself on my computer there just just because you, you've mentioned um he developed type 2 diabetes and we mentioned different diseases that men are prone to um yeah and i was interested in how physical training comes in in the prevention of these diseases as well as the treatment of them and there's four that i kind of want to focus on cool. actually two are, are linked which is type 2 diabetes and insulin resistance arguably a prerequisite to the la to the former mm. um and then mental health issues but you also mentioned things like sexual sexual dysfunction mm. which i think is a fascinating topic that people aren't really well people shy away from talking about it yeah 
can we get into that a of little course. bit? I think, uh, strangely enough, um, it's either everything or nothing. It, it, it's, it's a very <laughs> some 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 might liken it to a very male approach to the to the concern. That's that often is the way that sexual dysfunction is managed in uh with 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 men it's either it's not talked about at all or it's just all about testosterone replacement therapy and you know and using um pd5 inhibitors you know like Vi viagra or chalice yeah. or something like that you know to try and prop things up for a while or to to manage other other issues um and i don't think that that is the solution necessarily i think there's a, there's there's often a deeper root cause to the problem and and it's multifactorial i think um if i was to give my opinion on some of it um is that i believe some of it does come back to in terms of sexual dysfunction i believe some of it does come back to dopamine excess mm. in our society which is something that again um dr anna lemke has talked about in her I've not heard of her really should you know and also many anybody who's not heard of dr anna lemke her her key uh book is called dopamine nation right and she's uh she's been on several podcasts um and she's spoken at length about this topic her book is fantastic the reason the reason i bring up dopamine is because um obviously many people here listening will know dopamine is a is effectively a motivation um hormone neurotransmitter really the specificity um and it's it's really the reason we do anything mm -hmm. dopamine is is behind every endeavor that we do without dopamine we you know literally we, we wouldn't get up and do anything it's the driving force motivation desire motivation yeah. mating pleasure reward that's that's why it's so important because it helps to entrain behaviors but it's also the key one of the key neurotransmitters around addiction and this is why I raise this point because, again, and again, it's not a popular topic often with our um, our male patients, but um, often there's a link here between dopamine excessive behavior. So that could be, again, drinking excessively, using drugs. It might even be doing other things like using excessive pornography. Mm -hmm. um, it could be um, engaging in other, other practices, um, you know, the, the excessive um, use of the phone, um, you know, flicking through social media. Um, these are all likened to um, releasing dopamine at a level that is way above what we would naturally produce if we were just left in the wild world and let let nature kind of stimulate us, as it were. And what Anna Lemke um, posits is that uh, this kind of dopamine excess is basically what leads to a lot of these kind of dysfunction problems. And, mm -hmm. and, and she goes as far as she says, psychiatrist she goes as far as say some clinical conditions as well um you know so some individuals presenting maybe with some forms of depression it's because of the use of excessive amounts of dopamine releasing um aids like phones or whatever and things like this mm. so Phone specifically social media social media uh, but, but it could be shopping for right. instance ah of course i mean that could one click buy no yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah. On a lot of apps, I think yeah. is part of the problem. And I think this is the thing: is that a lot of these kind of, um, again, these a lot of these kind of behavioural addictions have not caught up in the kind of the mainstream, um, you know, mental health literature. Mm. So we talk, we've, we've talked a lot about, you know, in the past about, you know, people who have compulsive shopping addictions, or they're compulsive eaters, or you know, or they um, they have a behavioural addiction to other things. But then we don't mention social media. It's only very recently that this has turned up in the in, in the literature and it's frightening because again if we look at the statistics between uh, social media use and young people committing suicide I mean this is how serious it is the rates are absolutely exploding mm -hmm. and it all tracks back to usage you know so again to bring it back to our to our men you know quite often we recommend you know and again the terminology is you know, probably lacks lacks specificity, but we do what's called a dopamine fast with these individuals, which is something again that Dr. Lemke often recommends yeah. um, to her patients. And there's also some other practitioners who've done the same thing. But basically, we take take guys away from these devices for a while, and we try to use other ways of raising basal dopamine in a more holistic and natural way, like things like the cold therapy. 
Right. Yes, yes, of course. Yes, which has been demonstrated to raise basal dopamine levels over time, and, and it maintains that level. So you can literally improve your basal flux of dopamine. So your natural motivation is greater. Mm. Who doesn't want more motivation during the day and more more willpower? You know, it's fantastic. Um, and it also improves mitochondrial function bingo. as a result, right? Bingo. So there's lots of lots of benefits there to be had. You know, just from a bit of a um, bit of a cold shower in the morning. Yeah, it would a cold shower suffice in that regard for mitochondrial biogenesis and these dopamine. It's do- dopamine. It's, it's it's duration. So obviously the the natural bit that one needs to get through is just being under a really cold shower. You know, is not pleasant. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, a few seconds and most people are running away and saying, <laughs> where's, the, where's the hot tap? Uh, but if you can build up to uh, three minutes uh, and then start to do it almost as a, um, almost like a gym session in reps. So you yes. take, take a, a few minutes off and then go back in for three minutes. And then you can start to see some of the real benefits of um, this on kind of, you know, short and long-term motivation mm-hmm. over time. Um, the, the, the longer cold exposure, um, I believe is probably unnecessary. I think for, for this particular practice, it's got other benefits, I think. So the kind of Wim Hof style staying in very cold temperatures for a very long time, I think, um, probably is unnecessary for people who are just trying to improve their kind of relationship with these dopamine releasing activities and um you know just again just to bring it right back to the original question around kind of sexual dysfunction we have noticed that men again who abstain from say you know pornography their libido improves would you believe it you know again because they're not um they're not kind of um you know immediately responding to these uh, behavioral addictions as it were and people Mm. like you know jordan peterson you know obviously the very famous psychologist has talked about this very openly you know um you know in terms of his feelings on you know masturbation and use of pornography just just don't do it if you're a man just don't do it interesting that you said about libido and um libido and also sexual dysfunction because they're not always linked right no that's not that this is that's true that's true they're off they they often one one can can lead to the other, but they're not always linked. No, that's true. One can have a physiological component and one can never have another psychological component, certainly. Yeah, it's interesting because I know far too well that these um, social media apps, Instagram, for example, are incredibly addictive. Mm. I've definitely been on my phone and mindlessly scrolling and mm. catching myself, mm. right? That happens to a lot of people, most of my friends, in fact. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it's just like an automated response now, mm. which I think need mm. to, people need to be cognizant of. Something which I've used is grayscaling my phone. Yes, okay. Um, which actually works quite well. Mm. So basically you turn all the colors off to just differing shades of gray yeah. <laughs> it's not nice to look at exactly and that actually helps a lot yes. there was something that you mentioned before as well you said about um suicidal behaviors and tendencies and then said back to men's health but what we know is that young men are actually yeah. very prone to suicide it's one of the biggest uh, causes of death the, the highest rates um oddly enough in the um from the, certainly from the research from the men's health forum is that it's, it's it's right around my age actually weirdly enough which is 38 years old yeah. um so it's kind of in this midlife uh, if you want to call it midlife who knows what midlife is nowadays but in this kind of period of time between sort of the ages of 35 to 45 appears to be the, the hot spot period but i don't doubt for a second that you know younger men mm. are at, at high risk of suicide we do know that younger men tend to be at a higher risk for body dysmorphia Yes. Certainly. Um, so maybe those two are linked, maybe seeing something, feeling mm. inadequate, you know, and then mindlessly scrolling and then this leads to suicidal tendencies. Um, but certainly in terms of the, the, the data we've got, you know, from a public health perspective, and we've already talked about the shortcomings of collecting that data. Um, it seems to be the hotspot is that kind of midlife um, period. And you can easily build the picture of what you were saying with body dysmorphia and social media, et cetera, and they feed into each other. And indeed, I think, you know, these young men are going to become obviously the, the, the kind of the, the older men of the future, you know, and if these are unresolved behaviors and they're not dealt with, you know, and I'm sure as te- I mean, in the last 10 years, you know, how much has phones changed and, you know, how much has, you know, social media changed? You know, we've got like four or five different new channels for people to interact in. Uh, what are we going to have in 20 years? 
you know, in terms of interaction? And what would that mean for those men in terms of their risk? You know, who knows? It's quite scary, really, to be honest. You know, this is why, you know, as a father, I try to limit exposure as much as possible in these early years and try to get into these healthful behaviors and again dr lemke goes into this a lot in in her book in like how to um think about that in terms of bringing up young people in terms mm. of thinking phones and these devices as tools yes. not not gateways to your uh, social community the real social community is human interaction face you know? to face absolutely go, go and see them you know go and have fun with your friends you know in person you know don't do it just through a phone and i am um, yeah i mean i resonate with this so much because zoom conversations because i realized that i re don't respond well to not having nonverbal cues mm. i'm very dependent on those yeah. so like body language eye contact the way someone is sitting mm. their tone of voice which doesn't always come across mm. on a zoom call um better now i think yes. but but didn't used to be um, those are so important Agreed. and people just aren't getting that anymore or no, not, not to the same degree no they're not and then again when I reopened m my clinic doors you know um, shortly after we kind of started to you know um, have COVID safe procedures in the hospital you know there was just a you know deluge you know uh, of patients saying you know when can I come and see you in person you know I'll wear three masks you know <laughs> And I'll douse myself in antibacterial. I just want to be in person. People are dying for in human interaction, you know. And, uh, and and even though we've been, you know, back to some sort of degree of normal for quite some time now, it's um, I think people are still are still adjusting. You know, there's still that kind of scarring there from such a long period of loneliness. Um, and so yeah, so I think it's um, yeah, I think there's nothing there's nothing quite like you know real human conversation completely agree and i think we could go on about social connection for quite some time so we're <laughs> going to leave that topic there yeah. <laughs> but the dopamine fast i think is fascinating in regards to social media the pornography that you mentioned but also devices in general yeah. um, and i will link to the book that you've mentioned and what was her name anna anna lemke anna lemke in the show notes for people to access with regards to other illnesses that men are prone to as well, we mentioned insulin, insulin resistance. It'd be great to dive into what we can do or in terms of performance, in terms of sports or mm. physical activity, but also nutrition, how we can control that. Of course, that. yeah. And how that plays into longevity itself. So what what we do, again, following on from the uh, the chat around the Hadza and the hunter-gatherer, is that what we do is a what we call a flexible animal-based eating approach. Um, and... It has a lot of, uh, I guess, uh, similarities or influences from things like the paleo diet and the keto diet. But as we were talking about offline, those two diets, you know, whilst great in principle, have become so commercial in their application, you know, paleo bars and paleo pizzas and paleo crisps. And, you know, it's, it's, it, the problem is, is that promotes a lot of, I think, confusion with our our patients so we wanted to move right away from that even if the fundamentals of some of those um approaches are are within the f uh, flexible um animal-based eating so as it sounds like um we place a lot of emphasis on animal-based nutrition as opposed to the pr current paradigm which is plant-based nutrition and we can talk about that if you want uh, if we've got time um but we believe that that is optimal for uh, men's health for several reasons. The first being obviously is um, getting sufficient protein in the diet, um, which again, we, we touched on before. Um, and, you know, protein is incredibly important. You know, if we want to talk about something that's age related, you know, getting enough protein in as we age, it becomes increasingly important and a particularly bioavailable protein. We do know that the, you know, again, your, our ability to absorb um, you know, nutritive factors starts to degrade as we as we age. You know, just from the simply from the turnover of cells. Um, that's certainly from the literature that we've seen. Maybe this would be different if people were eating maybe closer to what you know we maybe should be eating from a kind of a uh, an ancestral point of view. But that's how the literature stands. So getting all those uh, nutrients in that nourish the gut lining, that give you enough protein to stimulate muscle mass and growth, we think is ideal for our clients. And again, focusing again on uh, not just uh, the flesh meats, but also organ meats as well. Right. We put a large emphasis on that as well. Again, they're not popular. Uh, you know, <laughs> I won't, I won't lie. Not everybody likes eating heart, you know, like me, um, or, you know, or liver, you know, or pancreas or whatever, you know, yes. but I think 
the problem is is that um again just to kind of dwell for a second on the plant-based side of things you know one of the pushbacks i often get is um well it's not a very sustainable way of eating you know we should be eating less meat etc well i think that's true if we're not eating the entire animal i think it's incredibly wasteful you know if we're eating all of it you know and as much as possible you know and we're using every scrap you know there's a lot of meals to be had absolutely and so i question whether that that is necessarily um a truism when it comes to sustainability certainly from a kind of environmental point of view the other one as well is that you know simply by supporting um animal based intake we, we support potentially regenerative agriculture if you're picking your farm well you know it supports grass fed you know um and good livestock and good welfare standards you know i think you can eat meat responsibly and that's way the way that we see it um we could talk probably for three hours about you know greenhouse gas emissions and yeah, water usage i love that topic yeah yeah <laughs> um, but, but maybe for another maybe time. for another time let's <laughs> let's do that one you mentioned protein intake and this is something which i find fascinating as well how do protein uh, intake levels change over time over the lifespan and should older adults like you mentioned because they're, they're not absorbing nutritive factors intake more well, one thing that is important to talk about, especially when it comes to men, is the effect of protein on testosterone. So uh, it's often is a not often talked about topic, um, but a, a very good recent uh, meta-analysis from um, Joe Whitaker, um, who's a, I, can't remember, I think he's at the University of Worcester. Um, uh, he had has done a fantastic recent large-scale meta-analysis on the effects of um, different dietary interventions from a macronutrient point of view on testosterone looking at all the available literature. And what he found was that uh, several things. Number one is that high protein intakes above 35% of um, total energy intake appear to drop total testosterone. So again, we can talk about the issues with that, shortcomings of that, by about five nanomoles per liter, which is quite a lot. It's about 30% yeah. reduction of, from the average. So that's significant. Yeah. That's pretty significant. If you're concerned about testosterone, it's something to consider. The The contra to that is that moderate amounts, which is a less than 35%, didn't seem to affect testosterone at all. So that's something to bear in mind. So again, let's put some numbers into this. So if somebody's eating 2,500 calories a day, 35% of total intake is around 800 calories, which is around 200 odd grams if you're a 75 kilogram um kilogram guy that's nearly three grams per kilogram that's yeah it's a, a lot of protein it is a lot so you know this is way in excess but there are some men who who do strive to get this amount of protein in because again more is better sometimes but it appears not to be the case for testosterone so we moderate that quite quite carefully and we also check people's bloods as well to make sure that you know we're, we're kind of optimizing that the second thing that um joe saw is that low carbohydrate diets and he defined low carbohydrate as anything less than 20 percent of total intake as carbohydrates so that could be quite a lot of carbs it's not certainly not ketogenic mm -hmm. didn't appear to affect testosterone long term and this is in line with some of the you know key figures in the ketogenic literature like uh, jeff folek yes. and stephen finney you know they've seen similar yeah, things to health i think it's, yeah, yeah. Steve Finney's. Yeah, uh, they've seen similar things in terms of testosterone performance with long-term ketogenesis and doesn't seem to affect testosterone. So this this is quite influential. So how does this affect our approach? So we, if a, if a man comes to us with frank, um, what we appear to see is insulin resistance or prediabetes, we do put them on a um, what would be close to something like a ketogenic diet slash pushing towards almost what some people might term as like a carnivore type diet. Yeah because you get that elevation in protein intake we get a we get the the support from the ketosis on reducing the carbohydrate load fixing those fat cells at a metabolic level which we again when we talked about um, um offline again is part of the the problem when it comes to insulin resistance it's basically fat cells that are allowing glucose in um when they shouldn't be they should be fully insulin resistant and this is driving the metabolic imbalance the other thing we absolutely do not allow is seed oils have you got time to dive into this because i think we should yeah absolutely so um in a nutshell um 
most seed oils, and again, when I define a seed oil, the ones that most people know are things like um, linoleic, linoleic acid dominant ones yeah, like canola sense. oil, yeah. rapeseed, um, soybean oil, you know, sunflower oil. Um, you know, usually it's just termed vegetable oil on most packaged foods. Um, the problem that appears to be the case with these oils is that when you have an excess of linoleic acid, um, the way I term it to my, my patients is that the fats that you consume is what you, you are composed of to a degree. These fats become impregnated into the membranes of cells, and that includes, obviously, the fat cells, as we've been talk, mm-hmm. talking about. And the, the effect is such that when these fatty acids are then broken down um, you know, through lipolysis, that they disrupt the Krebs cycle at a basic level. So effectively, the Krebs cycle, which is obviously the uh, the metabolic pathway that leads to ATP generation yep. in the mitochondria, Absolutely. doesn't get enough ATP. So you're basically generating inefficient amounts of energy. When you do that, there is um, some evidence that shows that an excess of reactive oxygen species are created. And this then starts to disrupt the structure of the mitochondria itself. So not only do you minimize the energy that's being um, that's being produced, you're actually damaging the power plant as it well itself. And this appears to be part of the reason. When that happens, your fat cell is in a crisis. You know, you, you're not producing enough energy, and you know, when it, we've now got a an deficit in terms of ATP production. So under these circumstances, the fat cell becomes insulin sensitive. And it allows glucose in, in in appropriate amounts. And so glycolysis is also occurring at the same rate at which we are producing, we are liberating um, fatty acids into the bloodstream. This is not a good situation because then the fat cell starts to undergo hypertrophy. And when it grows, it becomes inflamed. We start to get the release of adipokines. Mm -hmm. Um, So again, these are kind of inflammatory factors that come from uh, fat cells. This then signals as we as far as we believe muscle tissue to then become insulin insensitive because there's a signal saying well we've got an excess of energy we don't know what's going on and now we have a chronic situation where we've got elevated blood glucose we've got got glucose going into the fat cells when it shouldn't be we've got muscles that are insensitive and this is the metabolic syndrome absolutely in a nutshell and this is all caused i believe by inappropriate amounts of polyunsaturated fats particularly seed oils so when we take those out of the diet we suddenly start to repair all this the fat cells repair themselves the the uh, insulin insensitivity turns back on and the adipokines and again the time course for this can be variable between people depending on how much they've ingested and there's some suggestion that it can take years to, mm. to change over the uh, the fats um we start to repair the damage it resonates with me and what I've heard from Sean Baker and Dr. Paul Saladino yes, as well. Yes. And um, those two people talk about this at length. Um, but also the current paradigm is not really looking at the omega-6 to omega-3 no. ratio. And those are polyunsaturated fats, yeah. but just the omega-3 index. Yes. Why do you think that is and how much attention should be paid to that? I think the odd thing is, is that when when we have checked... Um, you know, uh, omega-3 red blood cell um, kind of uh, levels in our patients when they have reduced their linoleic acid intake, even if they've barely touched oily fish and don't take um, uh, kind of um, omega-3 supplements or anything like this, it seems to sort itself out. Right. <laughs> which is which is quite interesting. Um, and it also rings true that some of the literature around omega threes um, have not been able to replicate some of the findings that were previously found around heart health mm-hmm. and around again around uh, GLUT four sensitivity. So it makes me question again the, the I, I believe all these 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 all, these these fats are essential to a degree, but to what extent I think we are yet to understand properly what I do feel very strongly about is that by reducing those seed oils and getting those out of the diet and increasing the amounts of natural fats that come through from like stearic acid and things like this that come through from animal fats 
beef tallow, I think, primarily is one of those, right? Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful thing. Um, you start to improve the metabolic health of, of people, and particularly men, I believe, which, again, getting enough cholesterol into the diet. We know, again, I think from one of your previous um, hosts, again, talked about the essentiality of cholesterol and uh, for testosterone production for any any steroid hormone. And cholesterol makes up every cell of the body, so we need to we need to stop. I think with this um, with this kind of falsehood around um, cholesterol and um, not eating sufficient amounts, because I think we're castrating um, in some ways by doing so. It doesn't really make any sense. Yeah, it's an interesting one because this the focus is still around LDL, and I'm not really sure why at this point because no. it's not an independent risk factor for heart disease it's not and it's not and actually it's a what we see strangely enough is uh individuals with um because of the role that ldl plays in things like um immune cell function um it seems to have a role in activating what's called quorum sensing um this is something that i recently understood from um a very um uh, very well-spoken cardiologist, um, uh, and I, his name escapes me. I will get his name, and I'll put it into the uh, into the <laughs> description. Nadia is his final is, is, is his surname. Talking about the essentiality of LDL, and he was talking about this this quorum sensing, which appears to be um, sensing when a a pathogen comes into the body and lets out like a signal to say, you know, is it okay to proliferate in this environment? And the LDL particle is part of the first line that detects whether there is um pathogens there and effectively sends the macrophage to come and deal with it so i think the picture of ldl as the bad guy is just completely wrong and when there have been studies done where we have crushed ldl using statins we've seen in those populations like infections going up and you know people dying from infections you know these are observational studies obviously mm. but they're quite compelling, I think. In and if LDL was an independent risk factor for heart disease, then unfortunately, I don't think the data has has planned out that way. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. If you get extreme levels of LDL, I'm not even sure it's highly correlated at all. But it is context matters always. If yeah. you have hypertension, for example, yes. and high LDL, yes. then that you're causing damage to the L endothelium, and L that high LDL might exacerbate quite the problem. But I think this, yeah, context is absolutely key. Like high CRP, things of this nature, in my opinion, are more of a predictor of cardiovascular disease and basically any other metabolic disease as well. Yeah, and the sort of HDL to triglyceride ratio, I think, is Yes, it's more of a predictor, yeah. I think, than LDL it's anyway. What we, and that's what we tend to use as well when we're, we're sort of just doing those basic panels and, and seeing, you know is this is this man at risk you know and obviously doing doing the duty and getting a calcium ct score you know go and yeah. see if the if the, uh, the 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 pipes have furred up you know that's the, the best way is to you know to go and have a look and see and the, the 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 most interesting thing is when you've got very high ldl levels and everything is absolutely squeaky clean in there and then that again makes you wonder well how much is this really playing a role in the risk for atherosclerosis? Mm -hmm. You know, for me, it's it, yeah. For me, it's it's not convincing at the moment, really. Yeah, that um, carotid artery, the calcium score, that is not something which is done regularly. No, um, certainly in the NHS yes, doctor's no. office or indeed abroad. Is this something that you do here? And have you seen it to be efficacious yeah. in spying? Absolutely. So the cardiologists I work with do it, you know, routinely as part of their um, their kind of their their checks. And again, if they see high LDL levels, it's, it's one of the the kind of the secondary uh, checks that we'll do. Um, but what I would say is that um, one of the things that we found to be of, of huge value to our men is just getting them connected to good doctors. Good doctors, you know, that they, they give them a proper screen, people that they can trust, you know, they can go back to. Um, I think that has huge value from the Men's Health Forum I'm quoting here is that, you know, men who've had a poor experience with a GP, they just don't go back. They don't stick it out. They just think, well, this is a waste of time. I just won't go back at all. And that that's the dangerous thing, you know, in the space of 10 minutes. And I'm not pointing fingers here at doctors with their bedside manner. All I'm saying is that for whatever reason, a failed consultation 
has then meant that one man will not go back and he will potentially be a statistic in the not living quality years as he should do. He's been robbed of years of his life potentially because we didn't connect with him properly, you know, in that 10 minute scenario. And that's what we, we try to rectify. We try to get them connected with the right people that hopefully that they'll be bringing their, you know, their sons and their daughters along to, you know, a family doctor is the way it should be, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. I realize that we're coming up on time, but I've got a couple of questions here yeah, for yeah. you. Just to complete this circle, we talked about fats and protein. What's your thoughts on carbohydrates specific and sources? Of course. So um, carbohydrates. So I do believe that, again, once the individual has, our, our, our men have become more metabolically flexible and we've demonstrated that. Yeah, and so not insulin resistant anymore. Not insulin resistant. We've got them down to a, a, a respectable level of body fat, you know, and, and we're, we're, we're suspecting that they're now metabolically flexible, that they should be going into ketosis and out of it, et cetera. And we're comfortable with that. Then, yeah, absolutely, we, we will introduce carbohydrates again because, you know, from an ancestral point of view, there are not that many examples apart from maybe certain certain um, humans that, that lived in perpetual nutritional ketosis, you know, and they certainly didn't do it through choice. You know, it was because they didn't have access to um, carbohydrates. If they were there in the wild, they eat them mm -hmm. straight away. And so our bodies, there is a reason we have insulin, you know, in our bodies. <laughs> um, and, I, and again, to quote kind of Joe's literature, bringing those carbohydrate levels probably up to that kind of 20% mark which again, depending on caloric intake, is probably around 100 grams a day, 150 grams a day. Again, maybe timed around workouts and things like that, I think is, is quite important. I think mm -hmm. for men, again, for normal energy levels and, and feeling well. But again, it's personal. Some guys feel great, others don't. And there's, again, there's conflicting information in the, especially in the carnivore community about this on the effects on sex hormone binding globulin and, 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 and such like, you know. And I think this is where the, pers the personal touch comes in. Sources wise, we do tend to again start with um, natural sources. So again, we start with kind of fruits. We start with maybe some tubers, uh, dairy products. You know, raw dairy products, fermented dairy. Yes, ideally from kind of A2 type animals. So again, goats. You know, buffalo things like this. You know, as opposed to A1 um, dairy. That's kind of how we build build up the program. But this is why we put the word flexible at the front of our our eating approach, and we didn't call it a diet either. <laughs> Yeah. Because because it's got to be sustainable, again, yeah. not from an environmental point of view, but of course, you know, we would be, you know, absolutely remiss if we were thinking, you know, every man has to be following like this all the time. And, you know, even if they're eating some seed oils, you know, if it's in a very, very rarely, it's, it's not a big deal. Uh, you know, this is, it's all about context, again, as you say, you know, and, and actually, um, once our men have got to this point, this is what we actually encourage them to do is to kind of test the boundaries because psychologically, you know, again, if we go back to dopamine and, you know, and, and challenging reward, you know, the idea is not to be in a perpetual dopamine fast the entire time. That's not the idea. The idea is to be able to respond to pleasure and then to retreat from it. And so we encourage our guys to do that. And this is why we call this like the path to what true health because, you know, true health, I guess, is a bit probably a bit like, you know, touching heaven or whatever, you know, <laughs> never quite get there. Yeah. You never quite get there, but you're, you're, you're always in pursuit of it, you know, and trying to get closer to it. And this is what we're, we're gradually crafting over time at Miller and Everton, something that's a bit, a bit bigger and bolder. And, you know, we're in the midst of, of scaling up our kind of enterprise in terms of what we do for men's health. And so watch this space, you know, we'll be back again to talk about that. Great. Thank you so much, Rick. Is there anything else that you want to cover? Cause I know we're, we're nearly finished now um only that um you know I, I really hope i've not offended anybody today around <laughs> their, around their interactions with male patients at all and uh i hope that for anybody who's kind of you know uh was maybe uh thinking one thing about men's health and uh, working with male patients perhaps it's maybe challenged some of those um those beliefs brilliant rick i've got one last question for you and i didn't uh, prep you for this one uh, what is the most impactful health change that you have made in your life mm. and why Hmm. I think probably the most impactful health change I made, and this is even after I became a dietitian, is learning uh, self-control, which is a very difficult thing to do because we live in a society of excess. But actually, um, again, as part of the longevity spectrum, 
um, one thing that did shine through is not overeating, even if like there's a chance to do so. You know, yes. it's not doing you know buffet or you can eat buffets and this kind of eating behavior um that has actually had quite a profound effect on my own kind of eating behavior which sounds really strange you think that all dietitians are suddenly you know a very they should just get this anyway <laughs> but actually we're all human beings and um i thought that um you know and again as an athlete growing up i used to eat huge amounts of food and didn't care and i would go crazy um but actually that when I saw the impact that that might have on my health long term, this is something that I really took into consideration, and um, I think it's made a made a big change for my health. Brilliant, Rick! It's been an absolute pleasure speaking to you. I've certainly learned a lot, and I feel like we've covered a huge spectrum awesome. of topics there. Super, and I hope that we can do this again soon. Would love to. Thanks so much, Ben, for having me. Thank you for listening to the Functional Health Podcast. You can find links to everything that we talked about today in the show notes. If you have a second, please consider leaving a five-star rating on iTunes. It really does make a huge difference and helps get this valuable information out and reach more people. Don't forget to subscribe so you can stay up to date and know whenever I release a new episode. You can connect with us on Instagram, Facebook, or our website, and all questions are welcome. As always, thanks to Joss Aurelia for all the editing and thank you all for your support.